I'll be honest that sometimes I struggle with this idea that if someone is out of the classroom, that as a teacher, we can't learn from them. And I'm not saying that people that have left the classroom can tell you exactly how to teach in a classroom today. In fact, I'm actually, I, I don't believe that at all. I think there's things that we can learn from, from their experiences. But at the end of the day, we have to take that learning and make it our own because you know your community better than I ever would. It's one of the reasons that when I you know, speak, when I do workshops, I don't tell people how to teach. I just share thoughts on learning. And I say this all the time. Uh, I'm not here to share solutions with you. You have to figure that out. I'm just here to share ideas. Take those ideas and you make the solutions because you're the ones close to the community. You understand your context. You understand where you are in your journey. And it's one of the reasons I actually talk about how all learning is personal. Because when you think about this, the reason I say all learning is personal is that everyone listening to this has different experiences. And everyone listening to this has different gifts and abilities. And everyone that's listening to this actually wants to go in a certain direction. And so how you take this podcast, what your questions are, what your ideas are, what you do with this is personal. It's very unique to you. There's things that I might want to try to get across to you. But at the end of the day, how you absorb these things, what you create from them is a personal process. So I think there's a ton that we can learn from people who are no longer in the classroom. But I also believe sometimes that when we go into the administrative roles, um, we can lose touch with what's happening in the classroom. And, uh, and something I always say to people is do not make decisions for, for, cl- for people in classrooms unless you are constantly present in them, right? So sometimes we'll hear things like, well, that's going to be easy for teachers. It just takes 10 seconds or, you know, it takes this. But then we forget, you know, it might take the teacher 10 seconds, but what about the 25, 30 kids they have in the classroom? So there's something about that connection is that we have to really kind of understand the experience and what people are doing. And it's one of the reasons I really enjoyed this conversation I had today uh, with Stephanie Smith, because Stephanie actually was a classroom teacher and then went to become a school administrator, central office administrator, and now she's teaching the classroom. And one of the things she talked about was struggling with some of the things that she wanted to implement as an administrator and then actually having to implement them as a teacher and being a receiving end and seeing how sometimes there's a disconnect. And I so appreciate the vulnerability in that aspect. And so I think there's a lot we can learn from this conversation. I'm always trying to learn from this. I'm always trying to learn from teachers, administrators or different experiences. But at the end of the day, as I said, I'm going to make that my own. And I think it's because of what I do is because of what you do that we have to make this learning personal. The other thing that we talked about today was really kind of this connection to, uh, how, how we do our work in our own health. And as you know, as I've shared several times, especially in the past year, uh, my health is really important to me. And I feel that taking better care of my health has helped me take better care of others. And uh, Stephanie has some great tips. Uh, she's talking about some of the process, the things that she's going through to, to, to really maintain and focus on her own health. And so there's a ton that I learned from this podcast. I really enjoyed it, really had a great conversation with Stephanie, and I hope you enjoy it too. Welcome back to another episode of the Innovators Mindset Podcast. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of the Innovators Mindset Podcast. This is George Kroos and I am really pumped to have uh, Stephanie Smith, who is currently a teacher in Illinois, uh, in her classroom doing the podcast after... Uh, an extremely long day. So I, I really appreciate uh, you being here, taking the time to to join me today. And just a little bit about Stephanie, of what I know about her, and I'm going to let her introduce herself. Uh, she's she's has a big focus. It's, we actually had a, a good conversation about this, uh, but also I see you emulate it in the stuff that you share on social media, um, you know, with your personal and professional um, You share a lot of, you know, your journey in health and it's something that I'm very interested in. Obviously, I'm really trying to take control of my health, uh, especially, you know, during a pandemic. I think it's really important that we focus on being healthy ourselves because, uh, you know, obviously there's there's an impact to that and not just physical health, because I think a lot of people, that's what you can easily see, but mental health um, as well. But also, uh, you have a really interesting journey of, you know, going, being a classroom teacher, going to 
school-based admin, being in central office admin, now being a classroom teacher. So uh, some perspectives that are probably very unique. So I, 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 that's a, that's a very unique journey. I don't, I don't know many people um, that, that have gone that way, I guess some, you know, and, and, and I will say this, so you don't have to by choice. Cause sometimes. <laughs> Thank sometimes, you for clarifying. <laughs> sometimes people, sometimes people, um, <clears throat> I, sometimes people uh, do do that, but it's, and I said do do. So I have to point that out every single time if I say it. So <laughs> that happens. So anyways, uh, yeah. So like, I think that's an important element because it's like, what happened? Like, is that, you know, some people are like, what happened? Like, why are you back there? So um, Stephanie, thank you so much for taking time at the end of a busy day to spend more time talking about teaching. Cause like, what's better to talk about teaching, you know, basically all day long. So can you just tell us a little bit about who you are, what you do now, and how you got to that point? Sure. Uh, thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to talk to you. I, let's see, I started my teaching career in 2003 in Massachusetts. I was one of those uh, maybe nerdy, fortunate people who knew I always wanted to be a teacher. I had mm -hmm. some really awesome role models. And, you know, I, I loved English and liked writing and reading books. I was like, this is going to be the best thing ever. So I went straight from college uh, to teaching high school, which I did. Uh, took a little break to go to grad school and then uh, found myself teaching again. And, you know, I really did love the classroom. Um, had some cool experiences working in New Hampshire where they developed extended learning opportunities um, where students could get high school credit for doing things outside of school. Um, so some really like non-traditional ways that kind of informed my sense of what learning could look like if you kind of took away some of the uh, traditional model of the school day or even like a structured curriculum where kids could design these really cool learning experiences. So, you know, I relish that for sure. Um, I did become involved in curriculum writing and was sort of tapped on the shoulder by my principal to take on a role in the high school um, where they had some need to, to do that. Um, so it was through that process that I kind of became an administrator. Um, mm -hmm. And then my family moved to Illinois, um, to the Chicago land area from New Hampshire. And I landed in a really interesting district in the north suburbs of Chicago. Um, I worked some as a gifted and talented coordinator, um, organizing some enrichment experiences for students and, you know, coaching teachers through differentiation. Um, and then I found myself in central office administration, where I served as the director of learning for the school district for a few years. Um, and, you know, after a few years of being in central office, I, you know, a lot of it had to do, you know, I have young kids. Um, I have a second grade and fifth grade daughter. And um, my job was pulling me, you know, my work-life balance was not quite what I wanted it to be um, at the time with like evening meetings and things like that. Like I missed mm -hmm. my kids. That was a piece of it. Um, but, you know, uh, central office administration work can ebb and flow too. So it wasn't just that piece. Um, yes. Although that's an easy answer, right? Like I wanted to see my kids more. Um, right. But I really just miss the classroom, right? It's like I found myself in a position where the work was interesting and I worked with some really amazing colleagues. Um, I liked being thought partners with people and um, designing learning initiatives. I got to do a lot of really cool stuff, learning about technology. I got to hand a lot of people the innovators mindset and talk to them about empowering kids yes. and lead, lead some PD. I didn't, um, know, that. I didn't know that part. Yeah. Like, that's not why I asked you on the you podcast. You saw why you asked me on here? Because oh. I was like my receipt for book sales. <laughs> yes, no. um, cashed it in. Um, no. So all of that work was really interesting. But ultimately, like my day to day, like I, I felt like something was missing. And I know recently you were talking um, in one of your podcasts about this idea of like, what makes you happy? And like, mm. it, should you ask for a different role? And like, if you're coming to work every day and like you're not feeling happy, like certain aspects of my job made me happy, but like something was really missing. And I, I was, yeah. as much as I tried to spend time, time in schools and spend time with teachers, like I felt really far away from the kids and kind of far away from why I got into this in the first place. Mm -hmm. And a lot had shifted in education since I left the classroom. Like in that particular period of time, technology changed so much and resources changed so much. And even the ideas about empowering kids and giving them more ownership over their learning, things that I was 
leading professional development on, I hadn't experienced fully in the classroom. Right. And so like I had both like this desire to live a happier day to day, like being closer to the kids, but also like a real curiosity about like, can I do this? Like I'm talking right. to teachers about doing this stuff, but like, can I walk the walk? <laughs> um, and so a teaching position opened up in the junior high in the district where I work. And, you know, I went to my superintendent and I, I said, could I be considered for this teaching position? And, you know, I explained where I was and he, you know, ultimately is very supportive. And I went through a, a process. They didn't just, you know, put me right. back in the classroom. I went through a process in the building with the teachers and the principal. Um, but I've been back in the classroom now for three years. So it's been an interesting time to come back to the classroom right. for sure. Okay. When's, when's the hardest time I come back to teach? <laughs> right now. Yeah. Um, but it's definitely been a journey for sure. So, hey, like, it's actually like... There's so much I want to ask you about, to be honest with you. And um, one of the things that I know I hear a lot from teachers is that there's like a, a disconnect from, you know, central office admin. And you, 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 you kind of said there is a little bit, right? And one of the things I really focus on in my work, I don't tell people how to teach. I don't. And I think there's a, there's a little catch here, right? Because I think a lot of times people say, well, you haven't been in the classroom, blah, blah, blah. And I don't like when it's just like, we just dim dismiss because then I also see people that teachers love who have never taught a day in their lives. Right. And so I, I think we can learn from anyone and that's important. And it's like really, and I say to people, I'm, I'm here to give you ideas, but you have to figure out the solutions. I don't understand your context. You have to figure that out. So I think part of the, the way that I approach doing professional learning is to share ideas and talk about learning, but never tell anyone how to teach. That's, I don't really see that as my place. And I think, you know, that connection um, of, of, of what you kind of talk about. Um, I'm curious about this too, because, and I'm, I'm being very cognizant on how I word this, because I know that some people would not go back and this is not, I know this is not you, by the way, they would not go back to the classroom because they would see that as a demotion For or sure. a negative. And I actually think some people get into admin and they stay in it and they're not necessarily great at it. And it's not because they're not great people, but I actually, I, I, I excelled in administration. I was a much better administrator than I was a teacher. I can say that right away. And there, I think there's just certain things and I was, I'm still very, I was still very kid focused and things like that too. Um, but I just, that was just the role that I excelled in. But then I know some people are just much better suited to the classroom that go into admin and they won't go back because they don't want that perception. Right. Yeah. And I, and I don't see it as a failure, right? Like if you're meant to do, like, if you're meant to, like some people are meant to coach some meant people are meant to play right and i think that i would never fault someone who's like you know went to coach in a sport and say you know what this isn't for me i'm going back to play and do you know what i mean i that's a bet i don't know i'm trying to be cognizant of that because i don't want to like i i don't see it as i don't see it as i see it as a a step back i just see it as a, a different role right sure. I, do you struggle I, with that at all like um i I think I wrestled with the decision enough privately before I made it, like knowing right. that that was how I felt and also feeling like happiness and following like what you felt like was your purpose meant right. more to me personally. Um, I also was like um, studying to be a health coach and felt like compelled to be involved in that space as well. And so I felt like I was going a different direction, but I will say perception in a lot of ways, like as I talked to, you know, I did it within the same district too, right? Like, <laughs> which is right, kind of right. crazy, right? Like, um, so I did feel like I had to say to the teachers, like, this was my choice, right? Like, as you were saying, like, right, um, I right. really want to do this. Um, and I think for some people, you know, it's, it's really easy sometimes, I think, in any field to get on to this, like, path of, like, what am I achieving next? Like, if you're somebody that's not comfortable, and we were talking about that a little bit, like, when you're somebody that wants continual improvement, and you don't fear change, like, you can kind of get on this 
wheel or or this ladder, right, that takes you to a place. And then it's like you arrived and you look around and you're like, I'm not really sure I want to be here. Like I was following this path of like achievement and like taking on more responsibility and things like that. And like there are aspects of this that are really amazing, but like also this, I'm not sure that this is what makes me happy. And so like I could sleep at night with that, but I did, you know, there were people that were like, I can't believe you're like giving that up or, you know, like, Oh, like salary cut. Like people ask me all kinds of questions. And so, you know, I haven't, it's nothing I haven't heard, but I do like, I truly believe that like, um, being a teacher is a hard job. And so, Mm -hmm. you know, it's rewarding. It's also really challenging. So I think, you know, I meant it. I, I, (laughs) I wasn't trying to choose a a path that wasn't, you know, that was much easier. I really wanted to like roll up my sleeves and kind of like give it a go again. (laughs) I I think there's a, there's an important reason I'm asking this question because I know there's people listening to this podcast right now who probably are in central office, maybe central, you know, in that place. And they love teaching. They miss it. They feel that's a place to be. And my advice is be where you feel is the best place for you to be. That's, yeah. that's, that's, it is right. And I, like I said, it's, it's, it's a different, it's, I don't see it as like, it's just a different role. Right. And I understand, um, you know, obviously pay and all, all that stuff. Right. I, I do, I, I don't like people. There's, you know, people are like kind of, you know, crap on speakers and things like that too. And I see that this is what I'm meant to do. Right. And it's, you know, and I'm, I'm, you know, you do that, whatever it's obviously sometimes that's out of jealousy, to be honest with you. Uh, and, but uh, like, if I, like, here's my question all the time. What would I tell my kid? Like, no, don't go into that because people will think I, I would tell my kid, my kids do what makes you happy, do what gives you joy, give what makes you fill you up with purpose. And so, for people that are listening there too, right? I'm, that's part of the reason I wanted to have you on the podcast because I know a lot of people are struggling with um, their roles and maybe, you know, some are struggling the opposite way, right? I, you know, kind of doing this. So here's here's my challenge for this podcast that I'm struggling with, right? I want to ask you questions that I want answers to, but I, I'm like, okay, but I don't want to get you in trouble, <laughs> right? So like the one, like one of the questions and I'm going to see like, how could you answer this without you getting in trouble? Because you, it's like, it's like you're kind of undercover, right? <laughs> like you went into, you're in there. And so you're like, okay, I, like I used to work with that person. And I don't, you know, like, I don't know if they're making a decision. That's a good decision, right? Because like, I used to work. I know the way they think. So like, uh, how do you, I was an how, undercover teacher. <laughs> right. And yeah, totally. Totally. It is actually, that's just like, you give me a good idea for a different podcast in our other episode. Now it's like a TV show, like undercover teacher, right? Seeing this. Like seeing how the decisions are made. So like, how do you, how do you deal with that when, cause, cause the thing with central office, they make decisions that impact teachers. Yes. Right. Mm-hmm. And now like, so you went from being the person making those decisions to being the person that the decisions are often made for. And I, I, I'm a big advocate of like, you know, we have to get all stakeholders involved in decisions that we make for communities, obviously, but sometimes we have to just make decisions uh, you know, we can't get input on everything. Right. So how do you deal with that? Like, do you, how do you, and like as, as professional as possible, sure. I should, we, should have done, we should have done like a, you know, like a blurred out. Change my interview. voice. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we um, well, I think I'm fortunate and like, I, I'm not just saying this because it, it yeah, sounds right. good, but <laughs> yeah, right. I think I'm fortunate because I really do believe that um, the people making the decisions, uh, first of all, try and hear from all stakeholders as much as possible, like through the the processes that they use to make decisions. You know, almost always there's committees and opportunities for people to say things. And like we're a small enough district where, you know, we we call our superintendent by the first name, by his first name. Like he's a very generous person you know, and kind person. And I think he's approachable. And so there's like a community feel here that I think eliminates some of that. Like teachers Mm -hmm. do naturally have a lot of um, input and voice. And so I think that's one thing that's helpful. The other thing is I I do think um, we have people who have the best intentions for for teachers and students. And so I'm not left in a position to like defend a lot, um, which is helpful. <laughs> or, or ever, um, or ever. You know, or ever. <laughs> um, but I do, you know, I think just in general, 
it's like a perspective at seeing how things are done. Like I always felt this paranoia as a teacher before I was an administrator that I would be taking part in a process that was inauthentic. Like, oh, they already know what they want to do. And I'm just here right. like to go through the motions so that they can say there was teacher involvement. Like I was a bit of a skeptic, like, right. you know, just tell me what you want me to do. Like, right. right. Like I, I, I was a team player, but at the same time, like I, right. I felt like there was always like, um, a plan that was mapped out for like the next decade, right? right? <laughs> like we were supposed to follow it. And you know, the reality is things change quickly and there are a lot of moving pieces to what's going on at that like level of administration. And a lot of times they really do, you know, and I, I know I did as an administrator, I wanted to hear what the teachers had to say before decisions mm -hmm. were made. And like, sometimes I think that's hard to believe and like what I have found is on both sides um, and not just in this school district, like in other districts where I've, you know, held different yeah. positions, like people can make a lot of assumptions about what the other side is thinking. And like, it comes down to like relationships and communication. Like so often, you know, if someone walks out of a room, it's like, oh, well, like, you know, people heard that the principal wanted us to go ahead and like come up with a full plan for this. And it's like, oh, I think he was just like bringing that up to, right. you know, see if we had any thoughts, like we were, right. were not expected to like do any work on it. And so I think it's just, it's a reminder to me about the importance of communication and relationships and like, you know, for people on both sides to be open to dialogue, like when there are questions, because it's when people like sit and wonder and question right. and right. like they get paranoid and think that, you know, things aren't positive. Like that's when, um, the culture takes a hit. And so I'm always like, I'm a good listener. And I also know when people just need to say something and don't need an opinion. Right. <laughs> so oh. that's important too. <laughs> no, that, that actually, like, like it, when you talk about that, there's a certain amount of trust that has to go in that process, right? And trust is built over time. I remember when I was a principal, I would tell my staff straight up, hey, like, I will tell you when there's a decision that I have to make where I you're, you can tell me your input, but it's not going to matter because that is like, there's outside sources. So like sometimes it's a district demand that I have to do. Right. So I don't want to, I never want to get your input pretending I can actually take it and do something with it. Now you can tell me it, but just, I'm going to tell you straight up. This is not a, this is a, this is a decision that's made. But if I ask you for input, legitimately, like if I'm asking you for input, I am, I am trying to make a decision together as a community. Right. And so I think part of it too, is sometimes, sometimes what happens. And I think that's one of the, what I, I guess part of it was the reason I did that was because I got really frustrated when I would give input to stuff that I knew didn't matter. Okay. You know what I mean? It's like, don't waste my time. Just tell me that you have to do the thing because I don't want you. I like, there's, I would rather, you not listen to me, then you pretend to listen to me and then do nothing with what I said. That's right. where I struggle, right? And I struggle when I see that in schools with kids like, oh, we empowered student voice. Uh, we didn't do anything based on what they said, but oh, we let them talk. And it's like, well, don't waste your time. They got other stuff they can be doing, right? So that's something that's, you know, I think is that's trust. There's trust in that, you know, that process. Um, I'm going to ask you one more question about this. And then I want to talk about kind of the health and well being stuff because I actually think there's a connection between you actually going to the role of teacher and really kind of focusing on your health as well. And, and maybe I'm wrong there, but we'll find out right away. What was the biggest challenge for you when you went back to being a teacher? Like what was the biggest challenge that you faced? Like what, what, like, cause you said it was like, Hey, I, I struggled with some of the, like based on some of the stuff I was encouraging people to do, like, what was the challenge? What did you find was a challenge? Yeah. Well, I think, you know, first and foremost, like there is a physical energy to teaching that is not like replicated in other right. roles. So as demanding as administrative positions can be and as stressful as some moments and like there's like meetings that can be like high pressure and things mm -hmm. like that, you set your schedule in a different kind of way and you um, like the pace of your day can feel very different. Like when you're a teacher, there is just like this consistent sort of like expectation. So mm. like I, I was almost out of like teacher shape, right? So like using my voice that long, like I would lead workshops, but that's, you know, here and there in an hour. And then you're like right. off to the side collaborating with people, but like, you know, to be leading a classroom and like finding your voice again and just sort of getting used to like the physical aspect of the job. Um, 
I think was one thing that was humbling. Like, oh, I used to do this and like not think twice. And now like, I'm really tired. (laughs) Um, I'm also older, but you know, hey, that's okay. Um, You know, I think the other thing is I was so excited about a lot of ideas for things that had like come out when I was an administrator, right? Like I wanted to always know like, what was, what did the cutting edge look like? And Mm. um, I do think that those things are really important and exciting. And I, you know, you know, a lot of the stuff, especially with regards to technology, I had a lot to do with technology as an administrator and like, you know, we utilized learning first technology second, all about these like deeper ways to utilize the technology and, you know, it's like, I thought that was going to be like the biggest shift and that things were going to feel so different. And like, in the end, like relationships are still the absolute mm-hmm. most important thing in a classroom. And some of the stuff that I like made assumptions about as an administrator, like, oh, it'll take them like 10 minutes to do this. Right. Like when you put real humans in the room with that, like, especially I'm teaching sixth graders now, like things take longer. So, you know, my, um, my skills were a little rusty in terms of like pacing and stuff. And that was humbling because I, you know, with the best of intentions had been supporting instruction. And, you know, I think there's this aspect of like leading like a teacher where you still are trying to flex some of those teaching muscles, even if it's, you do it while you're leading PD. Right. Um, Because it's, it's an art form (laughs) for sure. It is. I like that. I like that. The teacher shape, right? Yeah. even like I know some of the ridiculous things I was thinking about when you talk about this, I'm like, like I used to be able to like not go to the bathroom all day. Yes. No. Right? Okay. Yeah. I gave up right. the ability to go to the bathroom whenever I wanted. That was like my you, like, you, like that's like a skill. Like that is like <laughs> something you develop. That like, it's like a yes. weird thing, right? The ability yeah. to like not you know to eat when you can, right? Not eat at a certain time, right? Yeah. I like I know this is a little weird thing. Like, I swear my knees were much stronger because I used to have to, like, bend down yeah. to talk to kids. And then all of a sudden, I didn't have to do that anymore. And then, I like, the first time, I'm like, oh, my back. Like, it just all of a sudden, you know, just like, to go out, right? I know that's not, like, questions. what you totally meant by teacher's Yeah, shape, no, no. But, but like, there is an aspect of it. Like, being yeah. on your feet all day. Like, you know, yeah. my shoes were probably cuter when I was, like, sitting in meetings <laughs> versus right, right, running right, around, right, which, right. like, you should be. It's totally fine. But um, that's okay, you know, and I do think that um, just all of it, all of that, like being in your physical voice, your physical body and listening, like hearing so many different voices, like and all the questions, right? Like that's, there's an energy to that. That's just different. Yeah. So, so, okay. So on Instagram, you are at edu healthy. I don't know. Is that your Twitter? Do you have Twitter too? Yeah. That's my Twitter also. Just everywhere. Right. So, okay. So just like why that why that twitter handle it's like tell me cuz obviously there's it's not just like oh this is free there's like obviously a meaning behind it so like what's the reasoning behind it sure well i think like i would identify myself like most by some like by that right like right. education and health are both like so essential to like the work that i feel i need to do and what i try and do for myself as well and so i think you know it's it's become a space to talk about health and wellness and also education. I do work as a health coach uh, outside of school as well um, and do some PD for teachers with an organization called Simply Be. They're like a, um, a wellness clinic in the area. And so like part of it is promoting the work that they're doing to support um, mental health and also physical health. Um But also it's just been something that I've been like so interested in for my own journey for so long. And I know that's something that you and I have talked a lot about. Yeah. Yeah. Well, like it it does, it does matter quite a bit. And I think um, we, we tend to kind of throw that aside and it does impact us in classrooms and our jobs and our work. Uh, When I was actually a principal, not everyone knows this about me. uh, I also taught spin. So I actually taught a spin class. Uh, I would, I could tell you literally my schedule. So I'd get up at five 15 in the morning. I would, uh, get ready, go to spin class. I'd be there at five 45, it started at six o'clock and I would play super loud music. I was the DJ, right. Fun. And I would yell at people and it was like awesome. And people like came there because they knew I would like get on their case. Cause that's the hard, like not everyone has the energy to do that at six in the morning. And then I'd be done at like 6.55. I'd rush home, get ready, 
go to work and I was just like, just chill all day. Right. And I was just like, like all like it, it, it gave me energy, but it also like depleted some, you know, maybe some getting worked up and things like that too. Right. Like you're not going to get in a confrontation with a parent if you yelled at a bunch of adults on spin bikes, you know, kind of thing <laughs> like that too. And that was like, that was something to me. I actually um, was asked to move to a different school and I said no, because I'd have to give up my spin class. And, and my superintendent to her credit understood that I saw that as a piece of me that made me good at my job. And if I had to give up that piece of me, I didn't think I'd be as effective. Right. And so, um, the, the nice thing about that process was I, I, I had to go every morning. I didn't like get up and debate whether I should go or not today. Cause I was the teacher. I was yeah. the instructor. So like, is the easiest way to work out is when you are teaching the class, you have to go, you can't not show up because other people are depending on you to do this. Right. But I, the, it did make a difference in, in my work, in the way that I connected with people. Uh, I will say this too. It, it made a difference in my confidence. And I'm not saying it just was like, oh, I looked better and stuff like that. I just felt better. Do you know yeah. what I mean? I felt I felt better um, throughout the day. So uh, you are actually embarking right now. I saw this on Instagram. And by the time we publish this, because this is going to be, we're recording this in 2021, but it's going to be early 2022. This is going to be out. So we'll actually, this people can check in on you if you completed it by the time. <laughs> yeah, end this, of January. <laughs> you're doing uh, the 75 hard. Mm -hmm. And I've seen that. Kind of shared on social media so what is 75 hard and what day are you on by the way today is day three of 75 okay. hard yeah right. so, so i'm not so, too deep in it but i'm committed <laughs> all right so it's, what, it, what is it okay Just for people who are interested in learning. so the 75 hard challenge is um you make a commitment for 75 days to do two 45 minute workouts a day with one of them being outside you drink a gallon of water each day. You pick your own nutritional approach, but whatever that is, you like don't cheat, no cheat meals or, or cheat foods for whatever you decide to do. You so read pizza every day is fine. <laughs> yeah, pizza. I mean, if that's your meal as plan, long as you so. stick to it. Yeah. Only ice cream for 75 right. days. Right. Um, no alcohol. And um, you read 10 pages of nonfiction a day. So it's all about uh you know, first of all, it's doing something that is just very challenging because you think mm. over the, I've done 30 day challenges. I, you know, doing whole 30 several times, like mm. eliminating certain foods for a period of time and like committing to like a cleaner lifestyle really changed my approach to eating and made me really aware of what was in foods. And that sort of sparked my, um, journey into becoming a health and nutrition coach. But, um, you know, 30 days is one thing, 75 days, like, and I am going to experience the holiday season and things like that. Like, It'll be interesting to see if you can make this commitment when life can potentially throw you curveballs over a 75 right. day period, right? Like tonight, I'm going to get home pretty late. Um, I have something after this and I'm going to have to take my walk outside. Like it might be nine or 10 o'clock before I get my walk in. Yeah. But like when you've made that stupid, commitment, stupid podcast. <laughs> not the podcast. Oh, wow. um, so, you know, I. I think the reason I'm doing it is because I think when I've read stories that other people have shared, it is the mental gains that people have right. achieved that really appeal to me. Like the physical stuff is great. Like we all like to feel confident and like finding changes in our body as we like work out more and things like that can be encouraging. But it, I always talk to people like, how do you want to feel? And right. I want to feel sharp and energized and uh, as happy as possible and confident like i think when you achieve something like that you have something like that to focus on it's like a huge feeling of accomplishment and you know it's about finding that edge like what can i do next that challenges me and pushes me to feel like a better version of myself and like that appeals to me a lot okay so so if you are interested follow stephanie on at edgy healthy more on instagram probably sharing this than you are on twitter yeah i am or you can follow her either place but you know cheer on as we do this you know, I'm going to tell you, I'm not that impressed with it. And why? Because you're in Illinois. Try that in Canada. We have to go 45 days, 45 minutes outside. It was like, they actually had a, a Canada versus Mexico uh, soccer game for world qualifying yesterday. And it was like, I don't know, I guess it'd be like minus five Fahrenheit. I don't know what the, it's like, it was, I don't know what it is. I can't do the conversion. But it was like minus 15 and Canada won, <laughs> of course. 
Because it's like so Because the conditions are unfair. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so like they, they had it literally. This is November 16th. They had the game. And it was like freezing cold where I like, like someone when it, coming from a totally different climate, I wouldn't want to be outside. Like they had like no, even Canadians were like, ah, it's too cold. I'm not going to that game. So, so what you're saying is you're not signing up for 75 hard unless you can run on your treadmill for summer, the, <laughs> for the second workout. Yeah, Cause there's only 75 days in a Canadian summer. So that's basically <laughs> all we get. Right. So, we'll see okay. if I survive and then you can decide. We'll see. Yeah. It's still, you know, like it's still, it's still Illinois, right? Like you're yeah. not, it's not the nicest place. Like oh, or I not think the nice weather, right? No, it's not. It's already like, I've had to take out the gloves and the hat and the coat and all of that stuff. So. Okay. All right. Well, that's good. <laughs> okay. So I'm going to, I'm going to give you, um, a healthy question, then an unhealthy question. Okay. So we'll tell you that. So, so any teacher listening right now, uh, any administrator right now, what, like, what would you give them advice to if they're like, I want to, you know, kind of improve my health? Like what, what, like what, what's the, cause they'll say like, where do I start? Like sure. what, what I know you could say like, there's a million places you go, but where would you go? Yeah. Honestly, I always start with people's sleep habits. Cause I really feel like sleep is the cornerstone of good health because it can affect your appetite, your, like your mood, your ability mm -hmm. to have the energy to work out and things like that. So you know, I take a holistic approach and evaluate that, but, um, you know, what are your sleeping habits like? And then gradually starting to peel that back, like moving your body for 30 minutes a day, doing anything too, is going to make a huge impact. Like if you're sedentary right now and you just commit to going outside and taking a walk, like that's huge. Um, if you can do that for 30 minutes right. every day, my whole thing is like, move your body, change your mood, because I really, you know, what happens to your brain from like a scientific level is really awesome when you exercise, but like, you don't even need to get into that to just feel it, you know? And people right. will say that, like, I thought about you and I went and took a walk and I did feel better. And they're always like a little mad at me when they say it. Cause like, it turned out to be right. I'm not sure right, that's right, a bad right. thing, but like, you right. know, the eye roll, like I thought about it and I did it and you were right. <laughs> okay, yeah. Cause like, I actually sleep is, I wasn't expecting that answer, but it is a very, like nobody, um, like people don't really talk about sleep. Right. I have certain podcasts I listen to that just knock me out. That's amazing. <laughs> right? Like, I'm like, okay, I'm going to listen to this dude. And I don't really care what he says, but their voice just puts me to sleep. I don't know puts why. Puts you right to sleep. Here's yeah. It. And like different things work for different people. Yeah. Right? And sleep hygiene is like something that people talk about. Like whether or not you should. Uh, okay. It's on. Yeah. What? What's sleep hygiene? Sleep hygiene. It's like, like, do you have a clean routine? Basically, it's like, what are your procedures for going to bed, okay. right? And they would say, like, um, you know, not having blue light, like not having your phone in your face right before you're going to bed for an hour is like a would be good sleep hygiene, right? Okay. Like, um, I have bad doing, sleep hygiene. I, have bad <laughs> sleep. Yeah. I mean, I don't have trouble sleeping, and so part of this is like all it's right. all individual, right? So if you're somebody that has a really hard time falling asleep, like you have to figure out what that routine looks like for you, and like what yeah. good sleep hygiene looks like for you, right? Do you need white noise? Do you need to go to bed at a particular time, or you've missed the window? Um, do you need to exercise like later in the day or earlier in the day to make yourself tired? Like some people do after school workouts and then it's like they're amped and they can't right, fall asleep. Right, right. Like, um, I need, that. I need noise. I cannot, I cannot, I'll tell you like my, where my mind goes at night. If I have silence, it's terrifying. So I'm like, I need something to distract me. Right. Oh, so, absolutely. Like white noise right. for sure. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So here's an unhealthy question because yeah. I, I have to do it. So I brought up pizza. You live in mm -hmm. Chicago. I do. Chicago deep dish pizza. Good or bad? Like I the truth. Grew, Tell the truth. I you can't just up. like it. You can't just like it because you're from there. Oh, I grew up on the East Coast. So like right, I that's feel why I like, asked you this question. Yes, I know you're no, I like a New York slice. Like I grew up outside of Boston and pizza Regina in the north end of Boston is like the best coal fired, like greasy slice that you mm. fold in half to put Way in better. your mouth. Like that's pizza to me. So right. like I knew that's like, why I was asking this question because I'm like, <laughs> yeah. she's not from there. No. I, I mean I probably like there are places that have good deep dish in Chicago for sure. Uh Blue Malnati's everyone loves, but like right. once a year, like I don't crave that. That doesn't feel like pizza to me. That feels like okay. casserole. <laughs> right. Right. It's not pizza. It's yeah. its own thing. It's mm -hmm. like totally. So like I, so the first time I had it, I'm like, this is disgusting. What I, this is not pizza. 
The next time I had it, I was expecting it to taste that way. And I'm like, okay, now that I know what I'm getting, I can enjoy this for what it is, but it ain't pizza. Right. It's its own thing, right? I agree. It's, it's just called pizza, but you're right. It is kind of like a casserole. It's very saucy. Yeah. So I am the the Detroit style pizza. Oh, okay. So like pizza. it's in squares. What's Detroit? Yeah, it's like in squares, but it's like... It's a little bit like it's more bready. Okay. I'm like, I like, yeah, it's good. It's okay. Good. So here is a totally not healthy tip, but, um, and I won't be doing this during the next 75 right. days, but I've yeah, recently. Sorry, not the best thing. Like, hey, what do you have? I know you're so out. hungry. Tomorrow I'm going to be like day yeah. one because I ate pizza. Right. Thanks, right. George. Right. Well, um, you just put it in your routine. You could have just had it every day. That's, that's your fault now. Um, so I have discovered that hot honey is like very delicious on pizza. So like there's a spicy honey. It's like pretty easy to get like drizzled on a slice of pepperoni pizza. That's, a, that's, something, you have you. To, that's something you probably have to do in Chicago to like fix the Chicago deep dish taste. You no, know, I wouldn't do it on deep dish on regular pizza. <laughs> All right. That's, hey, are you, and okay. This is that last question. Are you, uh, so do you follow sports at all? Like, uh, I'm more baseball than anything else, but I have oh, some allegiances. Who's your, who's your team then? Who's your your baseball team? The Red Sox are my team. Okay, Red Sox. So you're not. Yeah. So you're like not like you're just there. You're just <laughs> not like you're not like immersed in the Chicago. Like this is my eighth year here. I mean, like I root for people here who like make everyone else happy. Like it's Chicago. fun for me to see my Chicago. students. Chicago. That's my team, the Chicago. And like this, do you know this? Yeah. <laughs> You know that song? Yes, I do. Yes. I yes. have it on my soundboard. Oh, there you Chicago go. Bears. Yeah. Yeah. So I just, yeah. So, I'll okay. root for the Bears. I mean, I grew up going to Patriots games, though. You got to remember that. Right. Well, yeah. <laughs> Basically, your whole half your life, they've been, you know, amazing. Yeah. And then they have it one year, and now they're good again. So the Bulls actually are very, very good right now. Ah. So, yeah, Chicago Bulls are like, they're the most fun team to watch in the NBA right now. Oh, a couple of years ago, we were going a little more often and they weren't as good, but the games are still super fun. I mean, they're like, so good right now. They're I'm so, so attached to the Bulls too. Just like Jordan growing up. I mean, that was our like mm. childhood, right? So right. like, how Let's do you hope. not feel nostalgic seeing a Bulls game live? They, like, they are, they are like the team this year. I, right. I think they're going far. Just you heads up on the Bulls. I'm telling okay. you, I'm calling it. This is uh, November 17th. They are going to get at least to the Eastern Conference Finals. If not, get to the finals. I don't know if they can win it, but they're they're getting that far. They're so good this year. All right. I'm calling it November 17th, 2021, Chicago Bulls Eastern Conference Finals, right? Okay. So hopefully, are you not a Celtics fan, are you? Because I have to like, maybe I won't post this podcast. Oh, no. <laughs> um, I'm not currently. I mean, right. Larry Bird as a kid? Come Larry on. Bird, yeah. I met Larry Bird <laughs> on my 40th birthday. Oh, you did? Yeah. Just I, ra randomly or I, no, I saw, so, okay. I was actually at, uh, he's, he's at Indiana Pacers basketball game. So he's, I think he's the GM of the Indiana Pacers and Larry bird. So obviously, you know, this about Larry bird. Well, maybe not obviously like I know you follow him, but Larry bird is like standoffish. Right. So like I was a big magic fan. Magic's like super, you know, outgoing and just like show time and things like that. And Larry bird is like, kind of like to himself. And it was like, kind of the the two personalities right so uh i went to indiana pacers basketball game on my 40th birthday and larry bird was sitting on the side because he's the gm he's like sitting on the side and i was like oh that's cool that's larry bird that's like so cool right Cause kid i like i grew up watching larry bird i hated him by the way <laughs> right i hate larry bird because i was a lakers fan right and uh i saw a kid go up and get an autograph during the timeout, I'm like, oh, that's super cool. Like I said to the the uh, person in the aisle, that's super cool that kids can go get uh, his autograph. And she's like, no, anyone can go. I'm like, really? And she's like, <laughs> anyone, anyone in the stadium could actually go down, get Larry Bird's uh, signature, which I was like shocked that he would allow that. Yeah. And, and, uh, and he would like sign whatever. Right. So like every time out people go get a signature. I, I, I do you even care about this. I'm like, I, I do. Cause it. I'll tell you, I met a basketball player who was so okay. awesome. Okay. So, I go, <laughs> so, so I actually go, I'm so getting, I'm so getting, so I have a very good friend who's yeah. like a diehard, uh, very bird fan. So I have two tickets. So I get him to, so I go up to him. I'm like, Mr. Bird, I am like such a big fan, which is like, I want to say like, man, I hated you when I was a kid. <laughs> 
<laughs> but I was like, like you, when you get older, you appreciate those really good players, right? Yeah, the talent for sure. And and Larry Bird, I said, you know, this is such a cool thing because it's my first birthday, and he said to me, "Happy birthday!" And I was like, "Oh my oh. god, Larry Bird said happy birthday!" And then I sent my buddy the the extra ticket. And oh, he that's amazing! Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. I uh, randomly met Charles Barkley in Atlanta a couple really? years ago, and he was so gracious. Like mm. I did the same thing. Like I played basketball as a kid, and I yeah. used to foul out a lot, so I'd yell like, "No blood, no foul!" Like I was right. a big Barkley fan. Right. I really like the so Suns funny. actually as a kid. Yeah. Um, so when I saw him, I was like, oh, this is so cool. He just was sitting there. And so yep. I walked over like nervously and was like, Mr. Bar I didn't say anything like Mr. Barkley. I just wanted yeah. to like say hi. Right. And he was like, sit down. No, really? <laughs> yes, yes. He sat. I sat down. I met like his neighbors because um, they lived in the, the there was a restaurant and they lived above it. And he was so like generous, yeah. like, oh, you're visiting with your friends. Here are the places you should go to eat. And oh, you're a teacher. Like, that's so great. That's like, so he cool. just was so kind. Yeah. Like it fulfilled every like you know thought you have like about what how cool it would be to meet somebody like it's yeah. nice when people are what you hope they would be <laughs> he's like an interesting guy and i know this is like turning into a basketball podcast he's an interesting guy because his whole thing was like he was such you know so tough and like don't look at me as a role model right that's like one of his famous commercials and something he said and then he is like this very like down to earth the perception of it too right and he is actually like someone i'm very interested in like feel like like, to be honest, he's like a per he like one of my litmus tests, like, do is that a person I feel like I could sit down and have a beer with, right? Yeah. Even though I don't drink beer. And you can't have beer because you're doing 75 gay hard. So not for 72 more days. 72 more days. So, <laughs> anyways, I don't want this to devolve into because yeah, I know people are like, oh, here he goes with the basketball stuff. This <laughs> out, but that's okay. They can Google Barkley taking a golf swing. That's also right. fun to watch. It. Yeah, <laughs> it's very good. He's got the worst hits ever. So Stephanie, thank you so much for being on the podcast, especially after a long day um people if you're listening uh connect or connect with stephanie on twitter instagram at edgy healthy i hope people get built by the time they see this we'll see how you're doing we'll see if you're at day three we know that you know something went wrong right? well now and this is good receipt. positive pressure for me to stay on track right right so, yeah, by the time this is posted you should be done and have like we should see the results all that other stuff see how it went so <laughs> anyways thanks everyone for listening stephanie thanks so much for being on and Thank i you, hope George. everyone has a wonderful day